Today is Sunday, October 18. My name is Pastor Michael, and this is a special extended edition of Wilderness Wanderings. For the next half hour or so, I'd like to invite you to listen in to the scripture and sermon from our church's worship service. Of course, you're also invited and welcome to connect to the full service of worship this message comes from. You can find that on our church website, Emmanuel Ministries, under the worship tab. May God bless you as you hear his word. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. The Parable of the Unmerciful Servant Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found that one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii, he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how the Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A parable about forgiveness. I suspect that this is probably one of the more difficult practices that Christians wrestle with. And I think that increasingly today it is a practice that we struggle with because it is not a practice that is common or is um, explored or, or exemplified for us in, in many ways. And just let me mention a few things to sort of help you think through what I'm saying. Um, you all know that something that you put out on social media 25 years ago, well, not that social media was there, but let's say you wrote something 25 years ago, it can come back and bite you in the behind even today, right? Right? There are certain things in our society, I'm not talking about the church here, but there are certain things in our society that are simply unforgivable. And if you had a certain opinion 25 years ago, you're done. On the other hand, we live in a society that when someone does something wrong, we just say, well, don't forget about it, it doesn't matter. It's not such a big deal. Even when it is. Even when everybody knows it is, we don't know what to do with it, and so we say, it's not a big deal. You've been there, right? You've heard it. Or we blame it on someone's past. We say, well, you know, their parents did this or that, or they were never taught, or they've had these experiences, and we make excuses. And so people are not held accountable for their actions. They don't have to apologize because we have made excuses for them. Or, or we have the whole issue about justice. That somehow if there is justice, then everything is okay and, and things are resolved. Even though we know that is not true. 
I mean, think about the Jessup family. This week, they found out who the probable killer was of Christine, who was killed in 1984. So what? It doesn't make a difference. We don't know what to do with bad things in our society. We go way over that way or way over that way. But we don't know how to practice forgiveness. And it seems to me that above all, the church has got to be the community that illustrates for the world what forgiveness is. And so if we're going to understand what Jesus is asking us in this parable, then we're going to have to understand forgiveness. And so allow me for a few moments to explore with you what forgiveness is. And I'm borrowing from Louis Smeads, the late Louis Smeads, who was at one time Christian Reformed Church, uh, Christian Reformed, um, but ended up in Fuller, and I'm not sure what denomination he was part of there. But he wrote these books about forgiveness, and it's some of the best stuff. Some of you have probably read it. But when Louis Smees talks about forgiveness, he says the act of forgiving is not really about the sinner. It is not about the offender. The act, and he calls it the art, he says the art of forgiving is about the offended, the one who is hurting. And he suggests that there are probably three things that are part of the act, the art of forgiving. And the first, he says, is the art of suffering. If we're going to enter into the practice of forgiving, the first thing that we have to do is suffer. And what he means by that is that we have to to allow the impact of what has been done against us to enter into our heart, and we have to hurt. We can't say, well, it doesn't matter. Or we can't say, well, you know, they had a rough childhood. No, what we have to do is we have to say, that hurts. And we have to rage sometimes with the pain of what we are experiencing. The Bible practices this. Recall Joseph, thrown in a pit by his brothers and then sold as a slaver. Later on, he is meeting with his brothers, and they talk to him. And they they ask him not to seek vengeance on them, to forgive them. And what does he say? He says, you meant it for harm. He doesn't whitewash it. Whitewash it. When Nathan comes to David after the sordid affair with Bathsheba, Nathan tells him a little story. David gets all mad. Nathan gets his finger right in David's face. He says, you are the man. The Bible does not pretend that sin doesn't matter. And if we're going to enter into the practice of forgiveness, we're going to have to accept the fact that there are some things that happen in this world that bloody well hurt. And we're going to have to rage and storm. And allow that to be. The second thing that Louis Smees, that, that as part of forgiveness, is what he calls spiritual surgery. Again, this is not about the offending party. This is about the one who is offended. The one who is hurting, who is raging. We have to first of all accept this hurt and this pain. And somehow, we have to cut it away. And we have to separate it from the person who has offended us. And we have to be able to somehow look at that person and not associate that terrible evil with that person in the sense that that's all we see. Some of you understand what I mean. You know people that have done things to you. And and when you see that person, all you can see is what they have done. And we see as part of the act of, of forgiveness is to see more of the person there. Now that person is more than just the offense they have committed against you. Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for harm. But then he said, God meant it for good. 
Joseph acknowledges that there is more at work than just the hands of his brothers. And he sees a larger context. Forgiveness, the spiritual surgery, says Louis Spies, is, is letting go of, of, of that need to seek vengeance. It is letting go of that need to get even, to punish the person who has done something against us. It is to give up our grudges, and yes, even to get out, give up our anger. It is turning the tables. When somebody does something against us, our reaction is to want to get even, right? Someone punches us, someone cuts us off in line at the grocery store or in the freeway, what are, what are we going to do? I'm not going to show you what some of you do, because it's not proper for church. But the art of forgiveness is to let go of that need of vengeance of getting evil, of even, and to desire good for the person who has offended us, rather than cursing, seeking blessing. That's the art of forgiveness. As Louis Smead says, to set out to forgive is to set out to let the prisoner free and we discover that the prisoner is me. I'm letting go of the anger and the hatred and the desire for vengeance in my own soul in order to seek blessing on the one who's offended. When someone has offended us, and I, I talk about this when I used to do pre-marriage classes. I'll let Anthony do that mostly now. But it was, it was a great topic in, in pre-marriage because offense happens in marriages. And what we do then is we say, okay, you hurt me, so you have to earn your way back into the relationship. But to act the art of forgiveness is to let go of that need of the other person earning their way. And saying, you are back in the relationship because I have made it so. I have been gracious to you. Now, so far I've said two things. Suffering and the spiritual surgery. And I need to interject here and say that sometimes that's as far as we come. We don't get to the third step. Because some of the pain is just so hard and so difficult on this side of eternity, we can't get any farther. The third step is that we start over with the relationship. It's the beginning of a new journey together. There are still nasty questions that are unanswered. And they will remain unanswered. The future, of course, is uncertain. But we are not going to seek hurt and damage the other person. But we are going to forgive them and act in grace. Now understand two things. That forgiveness for us humans is never a one-time activity. I say to you, I forgive you, and that's it. The art of forgiveness is something that we often have to begin every day with. We know in the course of a day that we're going to meet somebody who has offended us. And so we begin the day with God and we say, Lord, help me to carry out the forgiveness I promised. Because today I feel angry at that person again. And I feel the hurt. It's still in my heart. And so the art of forgiveness is not something that we get over. But it's something that we participate in all the time. The first time is probably the hardest, and, and then sometimes the third or fourth time is, hard, is the hardest. But as time goes on, it becomes easier and more normal. But it's something that we have to live into again and again. I also want you to understand and know that forgiveness does not mean that we re-enter into the kind of relationship we had with that person before. It does not always reestablish the relationship because some things 
break trust. Trust takes time to be established. Forgiveness offers hope, but it is not foolish. It does not assume that the offending party has changed. And in the church, we have often missed this. We have often told people they are to forgive and then go back as if life is normal. And that's a mistake. Because forgiveness is about the offended party. But the offending party has work to do with the offending party says, now I'm fine. That's a problem. That means the relationship cannot go back to the way it was. All right, with all of that introduction about forgiveness, let's go back to the parable that Jesus is teaching this morning. And I want you to notice that Peter asks Jesus a very personal question. Peter asks the question. He says, how often must I forgive my brother or my sister? Peter's starting to catch on. He's understanding that Jesus is talking about his kingdom, which is a new way of life. And these are kingdom parables in which Jesus is teaching us about the way of life in his kingdom. And Peter's been listening. And Peter says, what must I do? How often must I forgive? Seven times? Now, you've you got to know the context, okay? For some reason, based on, on Amos chapter 1, the Jewish rabbis taught that God expected his people to forgive each other three times. All right? That was common teaching. So Peter knew that. And so Peter's been hanging out with Jesus for a while. And he's been catching on to some things. And he's going, okay, three times. And I don't think Jesus is going to be happy with that. So what if I double it? Make it six. Well, Peter thinks to himself, why don't I just up the ante a little bit? You know, tell Jesus I, I'm tracking with him. Jesus, how about seven times? You know, is that good? Is that the way of your kingdom? And, and so what's, what's Peter asking? Peter's saying, what's the law in your kingdom? Give me the book. Give me the rule book. Tell me how often I have to do this so I can be part of your kingdom. That's the question that Peter's asking. What's in the rule book? What law do I have to follow to be part of your kingdom? And Jesus says, ah, oh, Peter, really? Only seven? And here's where things get a bit fuzzy. Some of the translations you'll notice say seven times 70 or seven times seven or, or some variations of that. And so, you know, 77 times or 490 times or something like this. And so I can imagine Peter going, boy, I need a big notebook. I can keep track of all of that every time someone sins against me. Is that really what Jesus is about? Some new law? No. No, then he tells a parable. 10,000 talents. That's what the man owns the king. 10,000 talents. Now, last week, Pastor Anthony had a sermon about denarii, remember? Well, maybe you weren't here, you were at home, maybe you've watched it. Denarii was the average wage of a day laborer. One denarii. How many denarii are there in 10,000 talents? Enough for the average worker. All right, pay attention now. For the average worker to work... 150,000 years. 10,000 denarii is 150,000 years for the common day laborer. Now that's a rough estimate. It's probably more, but I thought that was big enough. All right. 10,000 talents, that is way more than all the taxes that the Romans demanded of the Jews in a year. Like, I mean, the Jews paid a couple hundred, a couple hundred talents, or yeah, talents every year. And, and so the number is just astronomical. It's like, huh? 
how can anybody be that far in debt? I mean, that's, how can anybody be that far in debt? And so Jesus' disciples are hearing this story, like a man owed 10,000 talents to the king. It's like, that's ridiculous. And the king says, ah, forget it. Let it go. Just write it off. Gone. It's amazing. That's what that is. See, the point that Jesus is trying to make is not that we have to have a little notebook in our back pocket and we have to record every time that we forgive someone until we get to 77 or 490 and say, okay, we've done our stuff. See, Jesus is saying, look, in my kingdom, it's not about a law. In my kingdom, it's about an attitude of the king. The king is a king of grace. Somebody has this astronomical debt and the king goes, Oh, there's no way you can pay that off. Just forget it. Go. Be free. Go home and celebrate. Rejoice. This is not a kingdom about rules. Sure, there are rules, but this is not a kingdom about rules. It's a kingdom about the attitude of the heart. That the king has a gracious heart that forgives. This is not number scheme. And so, some of you are old enough that this is not your first sermon on this parable. And I imagine that some of you have heard sermons on this parable, and yeah, I've given them myself, where the preacher has said, listen, you have sinned against God, and what your sin against God is not nearly as big as the sins that someone else has sinned against you. And so because you have been forgiven so much, you ought to forgive. Now I want you to think about that scenario for a minute. You have sinned against God X amount of times. And people have sinned against you, and their X against you is not nearly as big as what you have against God. Therefore, you ought to forgive. But that's a numbers game, isn't it? And that gives us permission to consider the sins that people have sinned against us and wonder if we have really sinned against God that much. Because I know that some of you listening here today have been sinned against greatly. And you're thinking to yourself, really? My sin against God is more than that? See, but that misses the point of the parable. It's not a numbers game. It's an attitude of the heart. That because the king is gracious, his people need to be gracious too. John Calvin, the forerunner of Reformed theology, said the simplest way to understand this parable is simply this. Never give up on anybody. So the question is, how do we get there? How do we get there where our hearts have this attitude of grace? And my friends, there's only one way I know of. And that is simply to hang out with the king. Now, I don't mean that in any kind of disrespect. But Christians often play this numbers game. Okay, I do so many hours of Bible reading every week, and I spend so much time in prayer, and so I'm okay. Or I go to church once or I go to church twice, I'm okay. And we play this numbers game. But what did Jesus say to his disciples? He said, come and follow me. In other words, hang out with me. Let's go walk together through the fields in Galilee and Judea. Let's go walking through the city. We'll talk about the kingdom. And so, and so when, we, when we think about the Christian life, we've got to get away from the sort of numbers thing of, of doing our time. In the wilderness wanderings this past week, we, Pastor Anthony and I have been reflecting on Nehemiah, and we talked about the fact that he spent four months in prayer. He was wrestling with the things that were going on in Israel, and he spent four months in prayer. Now, he didn't spend the whole four months on his knees with his hands folded. He was going, but, but he was hanging out with God. He says, God, what's going on? What do I do? 
And even when he got before the king, he continued in that attitude of prayer. That's what I mean, this hanging out with God and spending time with the king. And we'll, we'll see his grace on display as we read it in the scriptures and we experience it in this life. But understand this, that, that when we hang out with the king, we're also going to recognize that he is a God of justice. Again, he does not erase sin as if it doesn't matter. Jesus hung on that bloody cross. And the Bible tells us that he carried the weight of human sin on his shoulders. That was agony beyond belief. Sin matters. God never pretends. And so if you're wrestling with justice because there are things to be done against you, understand that when Jesus compares or talks about the king in this parable, he's telling us the king is a king of justice. And the justice is this, part of it anyways. And when we have spent time with the king, his attitude of grace becomes infectious. And those who spend time with him become gracious because they've been in his presence. And so the king says to that man that he forgave, go home and celebrate, you are free. What does a man do? He grabs a fellow servant who owes, owed him a couple of months worth of wages and he says, you pay up. And it was an insult to the king. That's why the other servants had a rag on him. It wasn't because they were tattletales. It was a dishonor to the king because the citizen has to behave like the king. This citizen had received grace, turned around and gave punishment. And the king says, it doesn't work that way in my kingdom. If you're going to hang out with me, you've got to become gracious. Otherwise, you haven't spent time with me. And that's why the man gets punished in the end. Go, spend time with the king, and learn his grace. Because those who are part of the kingdom become gracious. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, come to us with your grace. That we, too, may become gracious. That, Lord, we, your people, may show the world that there is forgiveness. It is possible. And it sets people free. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening in. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings. As you journey on into the week ahead, go with the blessing of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.